Dr. Elizabeth Lord Rollins completed her medical degree at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons and then her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center. She currently holds dual appointments as assistant professor of pediatrics and assistant professor of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive science at Mount Sinai Medical School. Please help me welcome Dr. Elizabeth Lord Rollins. I have to say, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning um, at the Women's Health and Fitness Expo here in Kingston. So this is the 13th annual, huh? Pretty impressive. Did anybody manage to see the uh, aluminum sculptures as you walk in? I love those. That was great. So it's great to be here in the Miller School. Back in the day, uh, I actually taught third grade for four years. So, uh, you know, educational venues near and dear to my heart. So it is a real pleasure to be here and, and I do anticipate a real fun and informative day. Um, I'm gonna go through these slides pretty quickly because I have a lot of them um, and I do wanna leave time for question and answer. Perimenopausal and postmenopausal patients have had a very hard way to go in recent years. 75 to 80% will have symptoms that they find disruptive in some way, but how those symptoms are addressed has kind of been a moving target, and not just for patients, but for clinicians as well. I have nothing to disclose. I have no financial interest in any of the things that I'll be discussing. But on the topic of financial interest, uh, let's discuss conventional hormone replacement therapy in the United States. The FDA approved estrogen supplementation to treat menopausal symptoms in 1942. When Robert Wilson published Feminine Forever, which is this uh, little gemstone right here, in 1966, prescriptions for postmenopausal estrogen were already increasing, but in the 10 years that followed, prescriptions more than quadrupled following publication of that paperback and continued to increase through the 1990s. Wilson wrote, quote, Many physicians simply refuse to recognize menopause for what it is, a serious, painful, and often crippling disease, he wrote. He considered, quote, all postmenopausal women castrates, unquote, and said, with hormone replacement therapy, a woman's, quote, breasts and genital organs will not shrivel. She will be much more pleasant to live with and will not become dull and unattractive, unquote, and if you can imagine, it was a bestseller. Go figure. Misogyny pervades this book, but in 1966, the image of a woman as finding her greatest fulfillment by pleasing her husband didn't seem like a throwback, whereas today, the language and the concepts seem kind of disturbing, right? But we still suffer from this image of female aging as a pathological process that needs to be cured. You know, on the other hand, I really like this picture. This woman is comfortable. She's very relaxed in her body. She seems pretty happy. Without pathologizing aging, we do recognize that there are several prevalent conditions that can threaten the good health of the aging woman. And in the 1990s, a few well-powered studies were started to examine whether hormone replacement therapy could in fact head some of those conditions off at the pass. So there are some observational and epidemiologic studies studying big populations that indicated great cardiovascular advantages of administering hormones. And proponents basically looked at the mechanism this way. We knew that estrogen, its function on the liver was to bring bad cholesterol or LDL down and to raise HDL cholesterol or good cholesterol up. And so estrogen was thought to be this absolutely fantastic positive thing for cardiovascular risk. Experimental models that were using monkeys at the time did find that estrogen treatment reduced coronary events like heart attacks in monkeys and atherosclerosis in the monkeys, but in those studies, the hormone replacement was begun immediately after the ovaries were removed in those animals. Observational studies also indicated bone benefits for taking postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy. Enter the Women's Health Initiative. It originally involved large scale, and I do mean large scale, you know, if you count the observational study, you're talking almost 100,000 patients here. The interventional arm that looked at hormone replacement therapy alone uh, encompassed almost 30,000 patients. So we're talking huge numbers of participants. Are you guys getting an echo or do you hear me okay? 
It's all right? Okay, good. I'm glad. If it starts to be echoey, then just, you know, raise your hand. You know. So basically, the WHI was designed to study hormone replacement therapies effect on cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, and osteoporotic fractures, with kind of colorectal cancer as a sidebar. So was it successful at that? We're going to talk about that in a minute. Wilson, Robert Wilson, the one who published Feminine Forever, he based his entire book, which is such a bestseller, on his experience with his own patients. It was about 300 of them, aged 40 to 70, that he had administered hormone replacement therapy to. But by the early 1990s, discourse in academic centers and also among folks who were just out there administering clinical care really turned toward evidence-based medicine. And so the WHI was kind of this great white hope of menopause medicine that maybe now we're really going to have these evidence-based answers instead of just going on the theoretics of what estrogen can do for us. So this is a quick look at the numbers of patients enrolled in each arm and I'm kind of tight for time so I'm going to keep it moving here. Women with symptoms were actually excluded from participation. And the thinking behind that was that this was a double-blind study. They didn't want women who were getting the actual hormones instead of getting placebo to know that they were getting hormones. So they wanted to select women who didn't have symptoms when they started. But many critics of the WHI point out that if you take a woman who's not having symptoms, she's not necessarily in the same population as women who are having menopausal symptoms. So that was one of the first problems. And probably the biggest criticism of WHI's inclusion criteria for subjects was the age of the women who were enrolled. On average, they were older than most women on hormone replacement therapy, uh, an average of 63 years old, and many of them had been postmenopausal for over 20 years at the time that they first started participating. Even so, the WHI will provide us with valuable data for years to come which is a good thing, right? I mean, the observational study alone is compelling. You're talking over almost 100,000 patients. Uh, we're looking at them for 12 years, and some of the variables are listed here, but there's much more to this study than even what you can see on this slide. I'll give you an example. Just the psychological and psychosocial observations alone divide up into all of these measures. And for many of these measures, there's three or four scales that are given just to look at body image, for instance, perception of figure. There's four different scales that are used there. So we're talking a huge amount of data, and it's going to be mined for years to come. So just a quick look at how we can actually interpret. When we look at this data, how do we understand the data that comes out of the Women's Health Initiative study? Well, event equals the disease. And just to give you an example, a relative risk of two can mean many different things. So relative risk, even though the data is given in relative risk, understanding the data in terms of excess risk or attributable risk is a much more realistic kind of picture of what the real risks are. Because when we just look at relative risk alone, it really depends on how common is that particular disease or condition. Let me give you an example. If you have a relative risk of two, but the risk of the condition is, say, one in a million patients, then the person who is exposed, or who, in this case, who takes the hormone replacement therapy, will have that disease or condition, instead of being one out of a million, they'll be two out of a million. Well, that's still not a huge risk, right? Because you're looking at an event that's not that common. But we could have the same relative risk of two and if the condition is much more common, let's say that at baseline, the people who are not getting the hormone replacement therapy, the chances of getting it are four out of 10. If you've got a relative risk of two, then the people who are getting the hormone replacement therapy will have that outcome eight out of 10 times. Okay, so now that's a much bigger risk. That's clinically significant. It's very different from going from one out of a million to two out of a million, but it's the same relative risk. If we look at attributable risk or excess risk, that's basically the difference between the risk that the people who don't take the medication have and the risk that the people who do take the medication have. So that, that's the difference, and that's why we'll be talking primarily about attributable or excess risk. Hazard ratios are basically work this way. If the hazard ratio is 0.5, 
the relative risk of the event in the exposed group is half the risk of the event occurring in the non-exposed group. So that's the way we understand odds ratios. Of the multiple risks of hormone therapy that are highlighted in the WHI, breast cancer has been a major concern, right? That's the thing that we hear the most about. These concerns are valid, but they should also be placed in the context of other risk factors for breast cancer, especially when we're counseling our patients. Some of these risks can be modified, like alcohol intake, and some cannot, like inheriting gene mutations. But many of these other risks have been associated with double to four times the risk that's been associated with HRT. This slide is busy, so I apologize. But one thing that I want to point out to you is the following. In the estrogen-only arm, which is what we see over here, we see the risk of breast cancer was actually lower than in the placebo group, okay? So, because we have, in the age 50 to 50, oh, you can't really see that here, okay. But this is heart disease, this is cancer, breast cancer, and this is colorectal cancer, and this is hip fracture. I apologize that this kind of dropped off at the top. So when we take a look here, from the age 50 to 59 age group, we're talking a hazard ratio that's less than one. So the women who are exposed to the estrogen only actually have a less common likelihood of an outcome of breast cancer than the ones that are not exposed. That is maintained here in 60 to 69, and it gets closer to the ones who don't take estrogen. 0.94 is almost the same as 1.0, right? So that's almost an equal risk. So it seems to drop off as women get older. But if we take a look at the estrogen plus progestin arm, here we're having values that are more than 1, 1.2, 1.22, 1.34. Never does it rise to more than one and a quarter times the risk of women who are non-exposed to estrogen. We defined coronary heart disease in the Women's Health Initiative study as acute MI, myocardial infarction, otherwise known as heart attack, a silent MI as discovered by serial EKGs that were done at every study visit, and death due to coronary heart disease. So that's how it was defined. In year six and beyond, the increased rates of coronary heart disease in the placebo group actually caught up to those. The placebo group is in orange here, the estrogen plus progestin group is shown in blue. So we can see that here it's really lower than the hormone replacement group, but then past year six, it's almost the same. And so when we looked at this data, it resulted in an apparent risk reduction after year six of taking combined HRT. But within months of initiating hormone replacement therapy, proteins are produced in the liver that undergo profound changes. And these proteins affect coagulation, in other words, blood clots, um, fats, lipids in the blood, bile acids, and inflammation. So these clinical consequences from the changes in the liver that happen with hormones can include clot-related events such as stroke. And that's why when we first start patients on hormone replacement therapy, we see more frequent events than what we see later because the body events that mediate those changes are events that happen in the liver and those are fast. Whereas cancer risk are because of gene mutations and gene mutations happen over a slower period of time. So it's quite possible that the WHI, which really only ran for five years, didn't even pick up on all of the breast cancer and colorectal cancer changes that we might see. I want to make it clear that although the estrogen-only arm of the WHI does not show excess risk of heart disease associated with taking estrogen only, there is a real difference between coronary heart disease events and what we call thrombotic risk or blood clot-related events. WHI's findings were actually not so different from what had gone before. It's just that nobody wanted to listen to the data that had gone before. The PEPI study that came out in 1995 showed that when we look at the blood cholesterol levels in women who are taking hormone replacement therapy, yeah, the good cholesterol went up, the bad cholesterol went down. But when you looked at cardiac events, eh, taking hormone replacement therapy was not cardioprotective, but nobody wanted to listen. Least of all, why a theorist who made Prempro and Premarin. 
the HERS study, and I know for a fact, because I was doing private practice then, and these people were coming to detail me every single week, the pharmaceutical representatives. The HERS study, the heart and estrogen study, which came out in 1998, studied whether PremPro, used for an average of four years, prevented additional heart problems in women who had already had coronary events. And the answer to that result was also no. But they did show less fracture risk which was definitely highlighted by the people who were in the pharmaceutical industry at that time. There's also biases that are inherent in observational studies. So when we do studies where we just take a population and then we look at them, there were people who took hormones, there were people who didn't take hormones. Okay, so what happens to these two groups? Because they're different. We can get some information, but there's also biases that are inherent in looking at that. Hormone users were wealthier than women who didn't use hormones. They went to the doctor more often. They were more health conscious than women who didn't. Even in the 1990s, there were warnings on hormonal packages that said, if you have a history of heart disease, don't take this medication. So if you look at groups just on that basis, the women who were at higher risk for heart disease weren't taking hormones in the first place. So we have some biases here. Despite numerous studies indicating that clinicians were not necessarily going to drink the Kool-Aid on the WHI, there is no doubt that prescription patterns changed significantly. Whether it was fear of litigation, whether it was patient controlled, there's a lot of reasons why this might be. But you can see the huge drop off. This data comes from Kaiser Permanente Northwest because they keep some of the best records in the country about what prescriptions have been given. So these are hundreds of thousands of women from the years 1996 through 2000, oh, excuse me, 1998 through 2006. And you can see the drop off here right around 2002. That was the year WHI was published. So like these trees, the WHI was huge, a wonder to behold, very impressive. We took a look at some of the measures that have been done. They're very comprehensive and we'll be seeing data from this study for years to come. And with a price tag of 168 million, that's a good thing. But WHI's omissions not only leave room for further study, they kind of suggest ways that we can benefit our postmenopausal patients, and they definitely suggest things that we can look at in the future in terms of studies. Number one, there's a growing body of evidence that transdermal roots of hormone administration are much superior to oral. There's less involvement and sometimes no involvement of the liver, and there's certainly no first-pass metabolism of liver when you give people hormones from a skin root. So that's an advantage. And in much the same way that what happened with birth control pills, we're still trying to find out how low can we go. I'm looking out into the audience here, and I think I'm older than a bunch of you guys. I'm 52. But when we first came out with birth control pills, they were six times the dose of the birth control pills that we give now. And the birth control pills that we give now still suppress ovulation. We may be seeing some of the same effect in our evolution of understanding when it comes to HRT. In addition to choices of treatment that may have been suboptimal, patient selection may have led to some misleading conclusions when it came to the WHI. I like my little lightning bolt there. This friend of mine tried to teach me how to do PowerPoint. I don't know, partially successful. Why is this so? Why is the timing of HRT administration so crucial? Well, let's take a little look at what hormones do in the cell. Over 20 years ago, when dinosaurs roamed the earth and I was in medical school, we thought that the long pieces of genetic information that went before the genes were basically there for nothing. We, couldn't, we called them nonsense strands. We called them nonsense strands because they made no sense when it came to coding for proteins. They did not code for particular amino acids. Now we know that those pieces of genetic information are absolutely crucial. Regulation of the genes happened there. So genes can actually be modified by chemicals, especially hormones that in many cases go right to the nucleus and sit on those promoter regions. Those will control when the cell differentiates, when the cell multiplies and divides, when the cell dies, and the different protein products that that cell makes or does not make. So they are absolutely crucial. This is a more graphic picture of how this works. 
In the case of endothelial cells, is a fancy word for blood vessel cells, estrogen represses expression of inflammatory genes. So let's say there's that this piece of genetic information is about to code for a protein product that's going to increase inflammation. Estrogen diffuses into the cell, gets in. So this is outside the cell, like in the blood. This is inside the cell, but like in the body of the cell, we call it the cytoplasm. The receptors for the estrogen are sitting in the cytoplasm waiting. Imagine that you're going into a subway where you can only sit down on seats that actually fit the shape of your butt. That's what hormone receptors are like. There's an actual shape that they fit to the hormone itself. The estrogen is taken up by the receptor in the cytoplasm that is the body of the cell. It is brought to the nucleus where it actively moves across the nuclear membrane, goes to where the chromosomes are, and sits on that promoter region. Estrogen will actually have a negative effect on production of those inflammatory proteins in the cell. These inflammatory proteins are kind of the middlemen when it comes to vessel injury. So in turn, these inflammatory proteins can predispose to damage in the cell, blood clot-related disease, and blood vessel disease. This is another picture of how hormones can have immediate effects. Because when we talk about estrogens and other hormones affecting the genes, we're talking about changes that persist, but also that are longer acting. They take place over days, weeks, months. Hormones can also have immediate effects on cells by basically binding to receptors that are here in the membrane and either causing that membrane to change in a way that ion channels open, just to give you an example, so that different chemicals can rush into the cell. Sometimes it's glucose. Sometimes it's charged molecules like sodium or potassium that can actually rush into the cell. Sometimes the binding of the hormone on this membrane receptor will change something inside the cell right underneath the membrane. That something is called a second messenger. It's almost like dominoes falling. You can think of second messengers as dominoes in the cell that knock each other over until there's an end effect on the function of the cell. Okay, all this is real nice. Thanks for the science lesson. What does this have to do with blood vessels? We discussed how estrogen was thought to protect blood vessels and be protective against cardiac disease because of its changes on the blood lipid profile of women who took estrogen. However, estrogen has effects on the liver, where specifically these chemicals that actually cause blood clot can be upregulated, where Chemicals that affect platelets and cause platelets to come around and clump together are also upregulated, and that's one of the mechanisms whereby blood clots increase in women who take estrogens. So if a woman receives an estrogen load after there's already existing blood vessel disease, we're going to have a completely different risk profile picture than if we'd given it to women who didn't have already existing disease. In the Korean War study, young men who were in peak physical condition, who had passed away on the field of battle, had blood vessels that were compared with the blood vessels of Korean young men in the peak of physical condition also, who had passed away in battle. And we found significant atheromatous plaques in these young men who were in their 20s, most of them not older than 30, already present. Women will probably be a little bit less because of the protective effects of estrogen prior to menopause, but there's no doubt that Americans have more atheromatous plaques than anybody else in at younger ages than what had been prior supposed. In the Women's Health Initiative, participants received hormone replacement therapy 20 years after becoming postmenopausal. So we have a significant problem here. And certainly, the data bears out that the cardiovascular risks in the WHI are not the same for the age, different age groups in the WHI. There are other factors at work here as well. For instance, estrogen upregulates nitric oxide in blood vessels. Nitric acid, oxide rather, has the effect of dilating blood vessels and aids blood vessels in healing injury. 
but there may be ethnic differences in how nitric oxide has its activity. For instance, nitric acid seems to be less active in African Americans than in Caucasians. This may be one of the mechanisms by where African Americans have higher rates of heart disease than white Americans. But different people will not necessarily react with the same risks if given the same amount of available estrogen. And nitric acid is just one of the mediators. Let's turn our attention to osteoporosis, one of the other outcomes that were examined by the WHI. When we talk about bone, what everybody really wants to know about is fracture risk. If you take hormones, do you have more or less likelihood of getting a fracture when you're an older individual? But it's also the hardest to study, right? Because fracture risk is going to be the most rare outcome, and it also is going to be the end point. You've got to study people for a long time if you're trying to get to fracture risk. Whereas if you're only looking at, well, what does their bone mineral density do as measured by a DEXA scan? And do they get diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis as measured by a DEXA scan? You can get that outcome a little bit faster. But having low bone mineral density and having fracture risk don't necessarily line up, especially in different populations. And recent studies seem to indicate that genetic influences are actually thought to account for about 80% of osteoporotic fracture risk. So we don't necessarily see these things lining up. Similarly, whether a woman takes HRT or not is relatively low down on the food chain when we talk about her cardiovascular risk. Even women who go through premature menopause, that is, lose their estrogen at, say, age 35 and age 40, they have less than a decade, they have more than a decade, rather, less of estrogen than a woman who goes through menopause at age 51. But they have less cardiovascular risk than a woman who goes through menopause at age 52 but smokes half a pack of cigarettes a day from age 16 to age 50. So although it's getting better, until pretty recently, we clinicians, and certainly not as OBGYNs, we didn't really take blood lipids seriously. You know, LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol, eh, something for your primary doctor, you know, to follow up on. But I really encourage folks who see women and, and workers in women's health, no matter what the level, to really follow up on this at every visit. If you're not the person managing it, then at least inquire, you know, how are your lifestyle changes going on? What are your latest numbers? You know, have you been following this? Send the message. This will kill you. Take it seriously. I do. That's the message you want to send to your patients. I used to joke around with my medical students, what's the definition of a double-blind study? an orthopedist and an OBGYN looking at an EKG. That's what I would tell them. But this mnemonic, aloha, can help even us clueless OBGYNs sort of give us a starting point about how to manage our postmenopausal patients with regard to cardiac risk. And like everything else in medicine, the most important thing is to do no harm, right? If you give them 17 OH estradiol, you can get an estradiol level. And the sweet spot that we're looking for in perimenopausal and postmenopausal patients is between 35 and 50 picograms per cc of estrogen. Above 35 is going to give us bone benefit. Below 50 gives us the lowest, what we call proliferative risk. Because estrogen says to cells, grow, divide. So it says that to breast cancer. It says that to breast cells right, giving us risk of breast cancer. It says that to the cells of the uterine lining, giving us the risk of endometrial cancer. But at doses less than, when, when you have a serum level that's less than 50 picograms per cc, it seems that that message is lower. So that's the sweet spot that we're looking for. You're only going to be able to monitor that if you give estradiol. Progesterone, micronized progesterone, which is the product that actually we make before we go through menopause, is the product that is also been shown to be far superior to medroxyprogesterone acetate, which was in pretty much, well, I wouldn't say all the formulations, but it was certainly the most commonly administered progestin um, from the time it was introduced in the late 40s all the way up through the late 1990s. What does this mean exactly? The shortest possible dose for the shortest amount of time possible. We're still trying to answer that question. 
And, and I, I would tell everybody to kind of keep your you know, ear to the ground for the result of the KEEPS trial. Um, it, it's the Kronos estrogen trial. It was supposed to end last year in 2012, although I think the NIH is extending it. But this trial basically looks at postmenopausal women who are three years out of the menopausal transition and less. And it also is uh, looking at estradiol rather than conjugated equine estrogens and micronized progesterone. So I do anticipate there's going to be significant answers from that. We've kind of gone over systemic HRT as risk for breast cancer and ovarian cancer patients. There were other studies that were conducted in Europe, um, Scandinavia uh, specifically that looked at these risks and found that to be unacceptable, elevated to twice the level in women who were taking estrogens as opposed to women who were not. Dose tapering is a concern. When women decide to stop hormone replacement therapy, highly recommend that you kind of take your patients through a very gradual taper. The reason for this are twofold. There's some concern that the progestin component may not be sufficient to stop the uterine lining from growing if you taper it too fast. Because the progestin, if you, if you end it at the same time, the, the effects of estrogen degrade in the blood slower than the effects of progesterone, which is a fast on, fast off hormone. So if you stop them at the same time, the person ends up with a net estrogenic effect because the half-life of estrogen is longer. So to taper slowly is the way to go. The other thing is that when women have been taking hormones and then they stop them suddenly, they become very symptomatic. And the likelihood that they're going to go back on the hormone replacement therapy without necessarily telling you is relatively high. And that will confer increased blood clot risk. So you want that to be avoided. We've discussed why it's advantageous to bypass the liver. Results from randomized controlled trials confirm that the risk of blood clot among women using oral estrogens is more than double that of women who are not exposed. But in this large study that came out of the United Kingdom, Spiroff found, and, and this study included more than 15,000 women, Spiroff found in his analysis that the risk of stroke in women using the transdermals was actually less than in those women who were not using anything as long as the dose was 50 micrograms or less. Now again, we may see some bias here. This, this study was observational. So those women may be of less risk, they may have, you know, they may be exercising more, they may be more health conscious, but uh, it's pretty compelling data when you take into account there were 15,000 women studied. The major difference in bioidenticals is the progestin component. I mentioned that medroxyprogesterone acetate, first invented in the late 1940s, which was used in WHI exclusively as the only progestin, may not be so great. How come it may not be so great? Well, it doesn't just bind to progesterone receptors. It binds to insulin receptors, thereby increasing insulin resistance in many patients and leading to abdominal weight gain. It also binds to mineral corticoid receptors. It also binds to androgen receptors and may be associated with increases in hypertension and acne and weight gain. So there's a lot of you know, things that may not be so great with that. Tibolone was a great hope. It has androgenic properties and initially in Europe was used for women who complained of decreased sex drive with perimenopausal changes. But it too can be metabolized to estrogen and although it doesn't seem to confer equal uh, breast cancer risk to conjugated equine estrogens, there is an increased breast cancer risk over baseline in women who take it. So uh, I don't know, I, the jury is out on Tibolone. I'm not a huge fan of that. It was initially thought to be a big advance. But what are we treating? You know, when I first talked about this discussion, right, it was many years ago when we first started talking about this, showed Robert Wilson's book, Feminine Forever, up on the thing, said that I have an issue with the way he pathologized any kind of perimenopausal change in menopause itself. And yet, when we see our perimenopausal and menopausal patients, there's no doubt that there are some complaints that they have. And it's incumbent upon us as the healthcare providers to include specific complaints in the review of systems, to really ask patients about them. 
There is some emerging data, for instance, that hot flashes may be more than just a nuisance. Even if you and your patients decide, we're not gonna treat these right now, or we're gonna use only lifestyle changes, more exercise, stay away from caffeine, stay away from refined sugars. For many women, they say that they have hot flashes right after a glass of wine. Alcohol tends to be a trigger for hot flashes in many women. Drink a lot of water. All these things can certainly help. Loose-fitting clothing. Anybody who's gone through menopause, as I have, you know, we know the drill. There may be a decision not to go ahead and treat these with hormonal modalities, but even so, the fact that the woman is having hot flashes and their severity is an important piece of medical information that should be noted by the clinicians. It has long been mentioned in the literature that patients will not discuss vaginal stuff whether it's incontinence, bladder complaints, vaginal dryness, they're not gonna talk about them, that's not true. What surveys really show is that clinicians don't ask women about these issues. Up to 75% of patients report not being asked about incontinence or vaginal complaints on a routine visit. This is a picture of the pelvic muscular supports and they're illustrated from the inside out. So basically, this is like looking down into the pelvic bowl, where this piece right here is the pubic bone, so that bone right here, and this, this is the tailbone. So we're looking down into the pelvis, this is the rectum, this is the vaginal canal, this is the urethra that takes the urine from the bladder to the outside world, and here we have the back of the pubic bone. In the prior slide, incontinence was listed in the pelvic column and in the vaginal complaint column, and the reason why I have incontinence in those two places is that we have two different types of incontinence. We actually have three different types of incontinence. Stress urinary incontinence, which manifests as leaking when a person coughs, sneezes, lifts something heavy, does any kind of activity that goes like this. If that kind of activity causes leaking, that's stress urinary incontinence. That's caused by weakness in the pelvic floor, where when pressure from above pushes the pelvic floor down because there's very little support there. When we have urge incontinence, that's incontinence that comes from basically the bladder muscle, which lies on top of the bladder like an umbrella, squeezing just because it wants to. Not because the bladder is full, just because that muscle is irritable and it squeezes under the slightest provocation, sometimes just emotional nervousness, for instance. That will cause the volume inside the bladder to decrease and more pressure against the urinary sphincter, and that's what causes the leaking. Then there is type three incontinence. Type three incontinence is basically caused by a weakness of these tissues, a literal thinning out of the tissues such that the sphincter has less meat in it, so that when the sphincter closes, there's less pressure that's brought to bear to actually close the urethral opening. So those are three very different mechanisms of incontinence, and some are vaginal, like type three, and some are pelvic, like muscle weakening, like the stress urinary incontinence that I related. This picture may actually give us a better idea. This is the pelvis as seen from the side. And you can see here how when the urethral sphincter closes, it actually compresses that tube against the vaginal epithelium and the connective tissues therein. Similarly, I know this picture is pretty tiny, but this is the pelvis and this is the angle of this cut. So here we see the vaginal canal, this is the uterus right here, this is the bladder here, this is the urethra coming down. You see how the urethra has an angle that's pretty acute with the bladder neck. It's almost like this kind of angle. So if you had a straw, like the straw that you take soda up with, and you take soda into the straw and you bend the straw, the soda doesn't go anywhere. But as soon as you let that straw get straight, the soda will drip right out. And in a similar fashion, if the muscles of the pelvis are weak, then every time pressure increases in the abdomen, the angle between the urethra and the bladder straightens, and the urine has a tendency to come right out. And we can see here, because this is the vaginal canal, this is the cervix, 
the urethra is going to be right in front of this structure and then coming underneath the pubic bone. And these are the muscles of the levator ani, right here, almost forming a bowl that keeps these structures up. Estrogen is tonic to the muscles of the pelvis in women in much the same way that testosterone is tonic to muscles of the upper girdle in men. So there's a generous supply of estrogen receptors on these muscles. There's also a very generous supply of estrogen receptors on bladder as well. In clinical studies, estrogen replacement has been found effective in treating irritable bladder, but not effective in treating stress incontinence. So is the cure for female urinary incontinence HRT? The answer is no, although estrogen will certainly help patients with urge. Much more important, again, are lifestyle factors. The mechanical factors that are really at work in stress urinary incontinence are abdominal obesity, frequent coughing, straining, for instance, in patients who suffer with constipation, and chronic heavy lifting. That's why, you know, being women, we do chronic heavy lifting, right? We're constantly moving furniture around the house, lifting up beds. You know, we don't even think about all the stuff that we lift. Local estrogen seems to be much more effective than systemic estrogen for this indication. So in other words, estrogen that we actually apply through the vagina. Why might this be? Why is local estrogen so effective for pelvic structures? Estrogen promotes glycogen formation. Glycogen formation, glycogen is sort of a starch inside the cell. And it's in the vaginal tissues. These vaginal skin cells are called epithelium. Dotor lines lactobacilli, which are helpful bacteria, they're part of the normal vaginal environment. They depend on the glycogen as a source of fuel, and they actually convert the glycogen into lactic acid. So that keeps the pH of the vagina down, which is where it is in a premenopausal circumstance. The acidic pH, in turn, will actually serve to defend the vagina against harmful bacteria. In addition, the estrogen helps to maintain the thickness of the vaginal skin, otherwise known as epithelium. This is a multi-layered epithelium, typically about 15 to 20 cells high. Postmenopausally, can go down to six or eight cells. In addition, without estrogen, connective tissue proliferates that makes the vagina less elastic and also drier. Low-dose estrogen applied directly to the vagina has been shown to help with vaginal complaints of dryness, although not itching, but you kind of have to take the bad with the good because yeast infections can increase underneath these circumstances. You know, I'm running a little bit low on time, so I'm going to move past some of these next slides uh, quickly to talk a little bit more about integrative approaches to the menopausal transition. Epigenetics is basically the study of how we can see changes in the chromosomes, the chromosomes that we were born with, but the changes we're not necessarily born with. The changes happen as a result of changes in the cellular environment. Sometimes these changes can actually be conserved into the next generation of cells. So we can think of the chromosomes that we're born with as kind of the big tuning dial on a radio. And epigenetics is sort of the fine tuning dial on the very same radio. When there's a lot of change going on, like bursts of cell growth like we see with puberty, or massive changes in the availability of hormones like we see with menopause, these epigenetic changes will show up more significantly because they basically translate into cellular change, changes in the actual function. And not, I showed a bunch of pictures of estrogen receptors before, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. Um, but I do want to say that some of the non-pharmaceutical alternatives to postmenopausal HRT really do work because they change the cellular environments in ways that we're really only beginning to understand. We know looking at epidemiologic studies and studying populations that exercise is good for us. But why is exercise good for us? We know that refined sugars and populations that take in a lot of refined sugars have many 
different and completely disparate poor health outcomes. Why is that? As we study this more and more, it really seems to come down to when we have a lot of refined sugars in the diet, we actually change the function of the genes that we were born with. The cellular environment changes, chemicals are phosphorylated that are not supposed to be phosphorylated. They actually block transcription of the genes by going and sitting on promoter regions, and boom, Houston, we've got a problem. So we're only now beginning to uncover the molecular basis for why these common sense things that our grandmama and great-grandmama used to tell us, eat your vegetables, take your carrots, get out of the house, go exercise, there's a real molecular basis for why those things work. God only knows why grandmama knew these things. In many cases, these studies are uncovering the fact that lifestyle changes work better than many of the pharmaceuticals we've been leaning on for years. When you break this news to your patients, they're gonna think that you're telling them, you know, I gotta go out there and hit like Venus. I've got a box like Pacquiao. No. This is what regular moderate activity looks like as a lifestyle. This is a lady, 47 years old, who lives in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. She bikes to work. She's a New York City public school teacher. This is not the Olympics. This is the life Olympics. We've got to move. There is considerable evidence now that cancer risk and cardiovascular risk decrease significantly in active, middle-aged, and senior individuals even when their body mass index remains elevated. That's good news, especially for a lady like me. I'm 200 pounds, basically, five foot seven, huge, right? I, hey, I, it, it would be great for me to lose weight. I'm also a breast cancer survivor, you know? I, I know that my risk is gonna go down for recurrence. You know, if I take off about 40 pounds, it is an ongoing project, believe me. But some of the things that I can do are to remain active while I'm trying to get this weight off. A lot of this stuff uh, is not news to any of you guys. Increased cortisol has certainly been linked to cardiovascular risk. Insulin resistance is thought to be the mediator of that. And when we talk about increased cortisol, increased stress, and the adrenal fatigue that can result, a lot of our patients and many clinicians now are turning to complementary and alternative medicine. Or utilizing both allopathic practices and complementary and alternative methods in a m sort of modality that is being termed functional or integrative medicine. A lot of this is patient driven. Our patients are coming in, you know, throwing a, a copy of hysterectomy no more on our desks and saying, doctor, have you read this? Okay, that's a good thing, that's fine. But it's starting to be increasingly uh, recognized by allopathic schools and allopathic schools of medicine that this stuff works. The NIH has divided complementary alternative medicine into six different domains. It's sort of artificially distinct, if you ask me. I mean, there are some areas where, yeah, we see definite distinctions. For instance, mind-body interventions, such as yoga and Qigong. Okay, those are very distinct and different from acupuncture and Ayurveda, which are different uh, medical practices, alternative systems of medical practice. On the other hand, manual healing methods such as chiropractic and massage typically will use as part of their program bioelectromagnetic applications such as stim and infrared, which decreases the formation of scar tissue in the spine. You know, that, that stuff has been proven on a molecular level to work. And very often they're used together. And there is almost no differentiation or division between pharmacologic biologic treatments in some cases such as probiotics because probiotics are thrown into this domain and diet and nutrition because probiotics can very much be a part of diet that's recommended in some of those in these modalities so you know in some cases the division is a little bit artificial however what's not artificial and what seems to be pretty conserved is that the overall orientation is providing the body with what it needs to restore cellular homeostasis. The idea that repair and recovery will follow and that healing is sort of differentiated from cure. You may not necessarily get cure, but will you get return to quality of life? Will you have cells functioning at an optimal level? That is sort of some of the uh, main unifying concepts of integrative and functional medicine. 
I had a couple of slides on the history of CAM in the United States. Uh, don't really have time to discuss it, but suffice it to say, we owe it all to our patients and the persistence of patients. I would have to say that botanical medicine is one of the areas where the United States really falls short of our European counterparts. Uh, in Germany, there are federal mandated oversights of botanical medicine. Um, and you know, when we talk about what is botanical medicine really, most of our pharmaceuticals are botanical medicine. And may I introduce to you all MF101. MF101 is an estrogen receptor agonist. So in other words, it goes and it sits on the estrogen receptor and makes it active. But it is selective for beta estrogen receptors. The significance of this is that estrogen receptors are not all the same. There's alpha and there's beta estrogen receptors. They're gonna have different binding domains. MF101 will bind to both estrogen receptor alpha and estrogen receptor beta, but on estrogen receptor alpha, it will not cause the protein to undergo what they call a conformational change. It's almost like when you put a key in a lock. You put a key in a lock and the shape of the key changes the lock and the door opens like that. That's the way these receptors work. So if something comes and sits in this interface, like MF101, and it doesn't cause a conformational change or a shape change of the proteins, you're not gonna get any doors opening. That's what happens on estrogen receptor alpha. On estrogen receptor beta, when MF101 goes and sits there, there is a conformational change and we see estrogenic activities in those cells. Well, where are estrogen receptor betas? They're in nerve cells. So patients have less hot flashes with MF101. They're on uh, vaginal skin cells. Estrogen receptor alpha is on breast cells, is on the inside of the uterine lining, and so that's where we're seeing the cancer risk from estrogen receptor alpha. And MF101 does not activate estrogen receptor alpha receptors. So this is a real big hope as far as I'm concerned and more to follow. What is MFM101? Well, it's a combination of 22 botanicals. Where did we get the idea for what botanicals ought to be in MF101? Chinese herbal medicine. Traditional Chinese medicine is where they got the idea for this. And like I said, it's in phase three clinical trials right now. So I can see my time is up. Um, I have to say, it's been more than a pleasure speaking with all of you. Um, Current recommendations are, as I said, keeping hormonal, uh, uh, keeping hormonal treatments to the lowest dose possible for the shortest amount of time possible. Definitely taking a look at transdermal formulations in our patients. Bioidenticals, if those are a possibility, they're not always a possibility. We've got many very high quality compounding pharmacies. Depending on your patient's health plan, she may not be able to afford them. Uh, but at this point in the game, there are many pharmaceutical options that encompass low-dose transdermal uh, formulations. And if the decision is made to go forward with hormone replacement, those are the things that I would recommend in addition to micronized progesterone in patients who, uh, and who they're indicated for. So thank you very much, and if there are any questions, yes. I'll take those. Thank you, Dr. Rollins. Thanks very much, Dr. Lord Rollins. Are you going to be here if anyone wants to speak to you? Are you going to be anywhere else in the building Certainly today? for the next hour or so, I'll be, you know, kind of right outside if anybody has any okay. questions, because I don't want to hold questions? up the works. Do we have any quick questions? Anybody would like to ask Dr. Rollins? I, there are probably lots of questions. All right. Yes. It's I, been great speaking with you. You know, I really, I, I apologize for this talk because I really do realize it's like trying to get a drink of water from a, from a fire hose. Mm. You know what I mean? A lot of information at once. But I will be outside if anybody has any questions. Thanks for your attention this morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Lord Rollins. Thanks very much.